so we're going to start a new series today. And as we start, I want to open with a fundamental question, which is this. Have you ever made a mistake? You ever made a mistake? Yeah, like who in here has made a mistake? Um, I've made lots and lots and lots of them. I want to tell one story. It's summertime, and so people saw me with the mic on. They're like, oh, are you going to tell a story today? And so I thought, why not? I'm going to start with a story, start strong. And so I want to tell a story about a water slide and a horrible mistake I made. I was eight years old, and um, we had this park in Denver called Water World, and it was my eight-year-old birthday, and all my friends came. And we're, I just thought, like, I'm, there's two type of people in the world. There is, like, fast, daredevil, water slide type of people, and then there's lazy river type of people. Who are my lazy river people in here? Who are just like, hey, I just, I just want to go to the water park and chill. That was me. I was a little eight years old, lazy river. But all my friends were like the adventurous people. And there was one water slide right in the middle of the water world where it would, like two water slides went down the slide. And one was like a, I don't know, it felt like a 500 foot drop that was just straight drowned into the water. And I was watching, I was walking by the water slide and I saw people counting one, two, three, and then splash, someone would come out of that water slide. And so I thought, there is no way you're going to get me on that water slide. But then all my friends were there, and they're like, hey, come on, you should go on the water slide. And so they're talking me up to it. And so finally I was like, okay, I got to be brave. I'm going to step in this water slide. So I remember walking up the steps. It felt like miles. I was like, this is like the Tower of Babel. I'm just going to heaven, walking up these steps. And as I'm walking, I'm hearing, one, two, three, splash. I'm getting closer. One, two, three, splash. My dad goes and he gets on the water slide. And he, you know, in the 80s, he was kind of bigger boned. And so he jumps in the water slide and they go one and then splash. He comes right out of it. And so they're there. And <laughs> that happened with my dad. And then finally, I'm next. Has everyone been, you ever been next on like a water slide and roller coaster where you're just like, what have I done? I don't, and I just wanted so bad. I was like, I'm going to turn back and I'm going to walk down that step of shame and just like not going to do it. I'm going to turn back. But all my friends were looking at me. And so I was just like, it was like literal rock in a hard place. I was like, I can't turn back. I got to go forward. And so I was there. And the lifeguard starts explaining to me. He's like, here's what you do. You just go and you cross your arms and you cross your legs. And if you do that, you'll glide like a little flower all the way to the bottom of the water slide. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, great. But I was so freaked. It was just a black tube of death that I was looking down and I couldn't hear anything he was saying. I just, it was like Charlie Brown teacher, like wah, 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 wah. And I couldn't hear anything. And all of a sudden I was just there and I was like, he's like, okay, are you ready? And it was like a William Wallace. I was like, freedom. And I flung myself in and I just flung into the water slide. Didn't cross my arms, didn't cross my legs. Everyone ran to the slide and they're like, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then they're like, what happened? This is a true story. I'm not embellishing this. If they had not been shouting so loud, what they would have heard is, Aah! what that sound was, was I was going down the water slide and I was like, this has to stop. It's too scary. I'm too freaked out. So I came up with a plan. And my plan was, I was going to take my little eight-year-old back and my little eight-year-old feet and wedge myself Aah! into the water slide. And I wedged myself in the water slide to where I stopped in the middle of it, like <laughs> wedged into it. And that uh, sound you heard was skin scraping off of my, f I know, sorry, it just got real, scraping off my feet and that thing. And I, it was so horrible. And then finally, a lifeguard like shines a flashlight and they're like, this never happened before. There's a kid stuck in the water slide. <laughs> <laughs> and so as they are, they're like, kid, you got to like let yourself down. And I was like, I'm not going to go. That's what I was trying to stop. And so finally, after like, I don't know what it was. It felt like forever. I finally like let my, arm, my feet go down and went down to the bottom of the water slide and splashed down. And I could not walk for the rest of the day because my feet were so messed up for it. And what I thought was, I was like, I would give anything to go back in time and undo that mistake. I would do anything. And have you ever had a mistake that was so bad that you're like, what if you could travel back in time and stop yourself from making a mistake? Have you ever had one of those like, ah, oh, if I could just have it back. And sometimes it's something big. Sometimes it's something uh, little, but we're just like, I would give anything to be able to redo it. Um, for some of us, it's that relationship. It's leaving that career, staying too long at the job. And we'd give anything to have time travel, but I'm, bad news for you, time travel is not possible. 
But what if you could hear from the person who had every success and made every mistake with Jesus? So we just finished the series on 1 John, John the Beloved, uh, incredible series. But now we're going into 1 Peter. Everyone say Peter. Peter. Peter, I was asking my kids this morning what they knew about Peter. And what's interesting about Peter is he has more recorded experiences and interaction with Jesus than any other human on the planet who ever lived. And so this series is called Devoted. And what Peter offers us is a time traveler. Peter offers us someone who has made the biggest mistakes and had the biggest victories with Jesus ever known. There's both good and bad with him. So, so look at Peter. He went and he decided to cast his nets down and follow Jesus. That was good. Then he also went and took his sword, cut off the ear of the high priest's servant when they tried to arrest Jesus. That was bad. He went and he was a disciple, the one disciple with the courage to step out of the boat and walk on the water. That was good. Then he fell into the water and drowned because he took his eyes off Jesus and nearly drowned. That was bad. He was named the rock that we should build the church on. That was good. He was also called Satan by Jesus. That was bad. (laughs) He said he would never deny Jesus. When Jesus talked to Judas, Peter said, I would never betray you. I would never deny you. That was good. He ended up denying Jesus three times. That was bad. Peter preached the first message after Pentecost. First message there, and 3,000 people. I've been on the steps where that message was preached and seen what it looks like, and 3,000 people came to faith after one message. That was good. So you see this man who was not perfect. Sometimes we're like, okay, the people in the Bible, they were perfect. Peter's like, listen, I've had every success and I've had every mistake and I can tell you what to do and what not to do. Peter's the type of coach that you would pay $10,000 an hour for just for his time, just for his advice on what you, you should do with your life. He will give you that advice. He will give you wisdom and insight for free, but you have to listen. So we're gonna listen today. Let's open scripture to 1 Peter chapter one. Uh, here's where it starts. To God's elect. Exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who have chosen according to the Spirit, or according to the foreknowledge of the God of the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. This is, by the way, a very debated passage of Scripture. One of the, a few of the words that stick out are elect. What does it mean to be elect? What does it mean to be chosen according to foreknowledge? I think scholars will debate this forever. This is a big theological point of this idea of elect and what does that mean? This idea of foreknowledge and what does that mean? But let me offer Peter's perspective on this word. In Greek, electos means elect or chosen. So Peter, the one thing you have to know about Peter, if you learn something about his story, is he was someone with nothing. Back in those days, to be great, you, it kind of was like my wife and I were talking about it, like in Hollywood, there's kind of like nepotism and that sort of stuff, so it calls it nepo babies, and so it's like, hey, this person has kind of an advantage, and they're going to get everything that they need. They have that. It was exponentially true in Peter's day. There was no self-made people. It was like you were have and have not, and that's all there was. And Peter's life and destiny was like, he's going to be a fisherman, just like his dad, just like his grandpa, just like his great-grandpa, catch some fish and die, and that was his destiny. But God saw something more in him. God said, no, I see something in you, and you are an heir to what God has for you. So I want you to cast down your nets and follow me. And so what's so interesting about Peter is, one, he was chosen. There's the whole uh, the series, The Chosen. Anyone seen that series? That, it's, it's incredible. And that, I love the title of it because it's like, hey, these people were chosen. They were the chosen ones of God. But the part of what Peter had seen is he saw he was chosen the, by God, but he saw lots of people, Jesus said, hey, come and follow me. And people said, no, no, I'm not going to do it. So Peter said, there's a two-way street here. One, God chose you, and two, you chose to follow God. And that's who I'm talking to today. So it's this sort of message of like, God chose you, and you have chosen to follow God. And so what Peter's talking about in this uh, first chapter is he's talking about what it means to be grafted in the family of God. He's talking about the Jewish audience, which would know the history of what it means. And then he's talking to a a Gentile audience who's learning about what it means to God's history. 
And so what we have here at One Chapel is we do a Bible reading plan where we go read through the Bible. And uh, if, you've, if you're following along with that, great. If not, you can go to onechapel.com. You can follow along with the plan. But one thing that I love about it is there's actually a um, videos that go along with each one of the messages or each one of the chapters. And so I thought I'd show this video that is about First Peter, and it's going to be like instant seminary. You're going to learn a lot about it, and then we'll break it down afterwards. So Tulu, let's go ahead and play that video real quick. The first letter of Peter. His name was Shimon, or Simon, when he first became a follower of Jesus, and he was part of the inner circle of the twelve disciples. When he made his confession that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus changed his name to Kephas, which is Aramaic for rock, which was later translated into Greek as Petros, or Peter. Jesus promised that he would become a leader among the apostles to guide the Messianic community in Jerusalem through its earliest years, and that's what happened. Remember the early chapters of the book of Acts. Eventually, Peter was called to carry the good news of Jesus beyond the borders of Israel, however, and this letter was written decades into that mission in the wider Roman world. We discover at the conclusion of this letter that Peter is in Rome, which he calls Babylon, and we learn that while Peter commissioned the letter, it was actually composed by a man named Silvanus, who was a co-worker of Peter. This was a circular letter sent to multiple church communities in the Roman province of Asia Minor, which is in modern-day Turkey. And Peter learned that these mostly non Jewish Christians were persecuted. They were facing hostility and harassment from their Greek and Roman neighbors. And so Peter wrote to encourage them in the midst of their suffering. And this helps explain the letter's design and its main themes. It opens with a greeting and then it moves into a poetic song of praise to God, which introduces the key themes that are explored in the main body of the letter, where he first affirms the new family identity of these persecuted Christians, which will help them see their suffering as a way to bear witness to Jesus. And this has a way of focusing their future hopes on the return of Jesus. Let's dive in. You'll just see how all the pieces work together. So Peter opens by greeting these churches as the chosen people of God who are exiled around the world. Now Peter makes clear throughout the letter that these Christians he's writing to are Gentiles. But here he describes them with phrases from the Old Testament that describe how God chose the people of Israel, the family of Abraham, who was himself an exile and wanderer. This is a key strategy that Peter repeats through the whole letter. He wants these suffering non-Jewish Christians to see that through Jesus, they now belong to the family of Abraham. And so they're wandering exiles just like him, misunderstood, they're mistreated, and they're looking for their true home in the promised land. Peter continues this idea in the opening song. He praises God for causing people to be born again into a living hope through Jesus' resurrection and the power of the Spirit. God's inviting all people into a new family centered around Jesus, a family that has a new identity as God's beloved children and who have a new hope of a world reborn by God's love when Jesus returns as king. And for people who have this hope, suffering and persecution is actually a strange gift because it burns away false hopes and distractions like a purifying fire and it reminds us of our true home and hope. And so paradoxically, life's hardships actually deepen our faith. They make it more genuine. Okay, so that's a lot. I can see like, whoa, that, that's a lot to think about. But there's some really, really great ideas here. One, he's talking about who's he writing the letter to? People who are across Asia Minor who felt, I'm a little out of my depth here. I feel harassed. I feel alone. I feel like I'm the one person of faith walking through this and this feels really intense. I feel like a stranger in a strange land. Has anyone felt that feeling with their faith ever where you felt like, am I the only believer here? Am I the only person? Peter's like, okay, let me talk to you. He's also talking to people who are like, hey, you are not Jewish, but you are jumping into the family of God and into this, not just Jesus, but all the way through the Old Testament between Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That great legacy is now part of your legacy. You are in the family. If you've ever been married, uh, I I was leading our Monday nights group, our young adult group, for years and years. And one thing I would tell people who are thinking about getting married is I was like, you want to get to know her and You want to get to know her family because you are not just marrying her, you are marrying into the family. And they'd be like, okay, Rob, sure, 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 sure. And then a year later, they were like, I had no idea you were so right. (laughs) 
And so that sort of idea of like, okay, you're not just marrying a person, you are jumping into a family with a history and traditions and a legacy. It's exponentially more true with our faith. We're not just, okay, we're following Jesus and it's, he's this one person. It's like, no, you are jumping into a long history of people who have come, of writers and authors and people who've lived this faith out. And so Peter's highlighting all those things. He's talking about the Passover. He's talking about all these things throughout this passage. And so I think that's really powerful. And we're going to see those echoes in this first chapter. Let's keep reading. First Peter 1, 3 says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness, genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are feel, filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So here's the idea of this section. You're chosen, but there are actually benefits to being chosen. You ever been chosen for something? Been chosen for something? Yeah, like I remember... <laughs> Uh, we do something here at One Chapel called the Turkey Bowl every year. And so we have the Turkey Bowl. It's right for Thanksgiving. We go and it's like everyone goes out on a football field and all of a sudden, we, I went this last year and there were t there's a first captain and a second captain and I'm standing with everyone else and all of a sudden I'm in first grade again where I'm like, oh man, please don't let me be the last one picked. <laughs> like, my pride can't handle it. And there's all these young buff strapping guys and I'm a older buff strapping guy. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, I was like, you can pick me. And so I was going, and I seen pick after pick, and then one, one of the people there, one of the coaches there looks at me and says, I want that guy. And I walked forward, and I was like, he chose me. And I'm choosing to be on this team, but he chose me because he believes that I offer something to the team. He believes there's something in me that I offer for that, and that I can do something. I caught two touchdowns and made the game-winning tackle in that game, by the way. <laughs> So I paid off, <laughs> but I was there, but I, but I was like, I felt chosen. And what I felt was like, I have to live up to that responsibility of being chosen. They chose me, but I want to show that I'm worth being chosen. Right. Have you ever been chosen for a job? Ever been there? And it's like lots and lots of applicants. And they're like, you know what? We went through all the applicants, but we thought you were the best person. We thought you were the one to do it. And it just feels like, okay, if I'm chosen for this job, I want to be the best. I want to give my all. This is what it means to follow God. Like there are lots of people who are there, but you were chosen and you chose him. And there's something powerful that happens with that. I think even uh, with, with my wife, Sarah, it's, it was her birthday on Thursday, by the way. Happy birthday, Sarah. Uh, when it comes to choosing, I remember like talking with my friend, Lance Coles, uh, around when I was deciding to get married and choosing to be married. And what I told, this is a true story. What I told him is I was like, I don't really want to get married because all the married people I know, or many of them seem miserable. <laughs> and so I said, how do you know you're making the right choice? Like, how do you really know because so many married people seem miserable? And so he asked me a bunch of questions. He's like, okay, do you have a deep friendship with her? Okay, tell me about her faith. He was asking all these different questions. Uh, are, are you really ready to be a friendship with her? Do you love her? Are you re ready to serve her? He asked me all these things, and I was like, yes, 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 yes. And then he said, Rob, maybe you should make a choice based off the convictions that you have and what you believe and who you're called to be and stop looking around at all, uh, all the other choices and start saying, what's going to happen with my life and my future and my family? You are in charge of that, Rob. You become that sort of man. And it just, it clicks something in me of like, okay, so many times we make choices looking at what everyone else is doing. Peter has this kind of uh, famous story. I asked my kids this morning, like, what do you know about Peter? And one of the stories that comes out is like, oh, he's the only, there are only two recorded people in human history to walk on water. One was Jesus. The other person, who was it? Jesus. 
Peter. Peter was the other person who went. All the other disciples were there. They would not step out of the boat. Peter was the one who steps on the boat and walks on water. He's like, I have faith for that. But what also happened with Peter? When did he sink? When he started looking around him. He took his eyes off Jesus and looked around what was going on. And that's when the winds and waves took him down. And what Jesus is calling us to is we choose him and we keep our eyes fixed on him. And that's when something powerful happens. And so when we are chosen into something, there are also benefits that happen. And this passage here uh, that we just read, verse three through nine, gives us benefits. So let's break down a few uh, big ideas in that. Uh, Verse number three says this, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection. You see, this is the foundation of what it means to be chosen by God, is you get a new birth. He wrote, it, he wrote it there on the scroll, if you saw that, to be born again. That idea was so, so critical. And so you get a new birth, and you get to remember the hope of the resurrection. And Peter had just seen this happen. He had just seen what it meant to have that sort of hope. He saw it going from hopelessness to hope. This is Peter who was there, and he's like, listen, I know what it feels like that all was dead and lost. I know what it feels like when we are there. Do you, do you know what it feels like when all feels like lost? The way that I'd say it like this, some of you know this story. There was a team that was down 38 to 26. It was the fourth quarter and it looked like all was lost. There was only six minutes left in the game, 38 to 26. This man named Vince Young steps on the field and he's like, we are not going to go down. Not on my watch. And so he goes, he scores one touchdown. And then with 19 seconds left, when all the odds makers says, there is no way that you can win. You are going to lose this game. It is hopeless. He goes, and with 19 seconds left, he rushes into fourth down, rushes in the end zone. And Texas wins that game 41 to 38. Uh, I know, I know. I... <laughs> Some of you were like checking your phone, then you're like, oh, I need to pay attention to this. This is getting really good. And so I tell that story because that's just a sports story, whatever else. What happened with Jesus was infinitely so much more where it seemed like all was lost, all was hopeless. This was not gonna go our way, but the story was not finished. And Peter said, do not forget that hope of the resurrection. Do not forget that hope. And by choosing Jesus, you were leaning into the hope of the resurrection that no matter how dark things get, No matter how difficult things get, not all is lost. God is still working in your life and in your story. And some of you are in here this morning and you're fine. Some of you are in here this morning and you're thinking, things are hard, things are difficult, things are getting worse. I'm here to tell you this morning, not all is lost. Hope is not gone. God is still working in your story. That's what Peter has for us. So let's go on to uh, verse four, which says this. An inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. I'm going to tell one more uh, sports analogy. If you are following my social media at all, you know I'm a big Denver Nuggets fan. And uh, the Denver Nuggets just won the championship. They were the joke of a franchise who actually won a championship. I know you're glazing over right now, but listen, this is why it's important. I heard interviews with these young men who were interviewed, and they're like, what does that mean? And you know what they said over and over again? They can never take this away from me. I will always be a champion. And the reason I think that's so powerful is because most things in our life, relationships, jobs, career, finances, health, thing after thing, life is a series of losses. Life is a series of things being taken away. But Peter says this, this is an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And I love that last one, fade. Like, hey, it needs to be just as big of a deal today as it was one year ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, when you first said yes to Jesus. That's what Peter's saying. He's like, this inheritance has not faded for me. If anything, it means so much more. And so I think that's so powerful. This is an inheritance that we've given that lasts forever. Verse eight says this, a genuineness of faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor. This is a big idea that we're gonna talk about in this book a bunch, which is like, what does it mean to be tested? There are certain things, how do you know what's real and what's not real? Well, even in that Texas story that I saw, you saw who the real team was because they were tested. The people who are in a relationship who are really there, you see the ones that last because they're tested. And in your own faith, all the more so, it will be tested. And there are some who it fades away and some that that testing actually refines you. 
Have you ever had that experience where you go through something difficult and it actually doesn't push you away from God, it draws you closer to him? This is something that happens and it's supposed to happen according to scripture. It's not just in Peter. Romans says this, now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. So these ideas, we share in suffering and we share in glory. Glory. And the final benefit is this, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so we're, we're there. And because of all these things, we are saved. And that hope stretches beyond any moment. But the salvation is not where things stop, Peter says. This is the next big idea in the scripture, which is this, be holy. Everyone say holy. holy. Verse 13 says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform. Don't do it, one chapel. Don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Listen, if you follow Jesus, you're not ignorant anymore. You know a better way. But just as he called you is holy, so be in holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. You see, Peter's saying, it's not that what following Jesus isn't, it's just like, okay, I say a prayer, I'm saved, I'm there, I'm good to go, I go and live my life. He's like, no, it must be a transformation. Peter talks about this. The reason he talks about being refined by fire is because this guy, I just read it, his whole biography beginning, he failed over and over again. And with each one of those mistakes and each one of those failures, he grew closer to God. And then he got it. He got like, okay, I need to be holy. If you commit to a certain college, it's like, all right, this is what it means to commit to the college. This is who we are. If you commit to a job, it's like, all right, these are the expectations of what you are. And when you commit to faith, all the more so in Jesus, it's like, okay, this is what it means. You don't just get to live your life. I love what he says in verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform. It's so easy to conform. I see it happen to so many people, but don't do it. Don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. There's a new standard that's been set for our life. So you take this on. I remember uh, another story, and I've, I've told this before, but like um, when I was young in my faith, uh, Chris Hodges was my youth pastor, and he was there, and I was kind of like the... I was the pastor's kid. I ended up like uh, not even going to my dad's youth group. I went to another youth group just because my life was kind of in a mess. I was feeling distance from God. So I was always the person on the back row, joking around, doing my own thing. And then like, I cared about God, but I just, I wasn't really walking with him. And I remember having a conversation with Pastor Chris late one night and he said, you know, Rob, why do you keep like, it seems like you're doing good and then you fall back into the same stuff again. Then it seems like you're doing good and you fall back into the same stuff. And I was like, I don't know. I think it's just the way I'm wired. I think I'm just drawn to that. And he's like, he's like okay, well, let, let me give you a challenge. Could you go one year without falling back into that? One year without sinning? And I said, there's no way I could do it. He's like, okay, could you go six months? Six months with just on the straight and narrow doing good. Couldn't do it, not six months. Could you go three months? No, I couldn't do three months. Rob, could you do one month? No, could you do one week? No, could you do one day? I don't know, maybe. Rob, could you do one hour? <sighs> Probably. Could you do one minute? Maybe. Rob, could you do one second, just one single second without messing up? Yes. Yes, I could do one second. And he looked at me and he said, well, then live life by the second. And that's what I want to say to you. We're look, we take on so many things of the past and the future and that sort of thing. But what it is, is moment by moment, second by second, when we choose Jesus. And if you've chosen Jesus, I believe that it can have an exponential return on your life. And I believe it will have an exponential return on you, on your family, on, on people you have ne never met before. There will be decisions that you make, choices that you make that will bless people that will echo throughout eternity. And I think the problem is sometimes we choose to follow God and we're like, okay, I'm doing it. I'm saying the prayer. I'm going to a group. I'm serving on a team. I'm doing these things, but nothing's happening. But a lot of times the life of faith is one of slow, a long road of slow obedience that brings us to God. We want things instantly, but the truth is to really follow God and see exponential change, it takes a long, long time. There's a, there's a challenge that I've seen before, which is like, okay, I'm gonna make you a deal. 
if I could offer you one of two things, a million dollars right now, who wants a million dollars, or one penny, you just get one penny, but I'm going to double it every day for just 30 days. Which would you choose? Let's see which the better choice is. On day one, you would have one penny. On day two, you would have two pennies. Let's, let's fast forward, it's getting kind of monotonous. By day 15, you would have $163. All of a sudden, by day 15, you're like, why did I not take the million dollars? I saw the person who took the million dollars, and I just have $163. I made the wrong choice. A few more, let's fast forward a few more days. By day 20, you would have $5,242.88. Doing better, but I'm 10 days away and I'm nowhere near a million dollars. I made the wrong choice. Let's keep going. Day 24, if you would have kept the penny, you would have $83,886. By day 26, $335,544. By day 28, $1,342,177. And by day 30, $5,000,000. 368,709. This is a picture of sometimes we go and we see the million dollars. We see the instant, like, okay, I want to make this happen versus the long road of like, all right, it's a penny day by day, moment by moment, second by second, that we live our life of an obedience to Jesus. And that's when we see those returns. Peter followed Jesus for years and years and years and years before he got to preach his first sermon. That's what we're called to when it comes to holiness. I want to invite you all to actually uh, stand up. And uh, we're going we're gonna to take a little bit of time and worship here. And I want to invite the prayer team to come forward. You can come forward. But what I want to offer you to this as we get through Peter and as we enter into this first Peter uh, message, it's just I know many of you are facing choices like that are not easy, that are difficult things in your life. And what I want to say to you is like, you do not have to face these things alone. God is walking with you and God has called you to something that if you will be faithful, he will reward you and he will bless so many other people. And so what we're going to do now is we're just going to take a little bit of time. We're going to worship here in our seats. And I invite you, like, like Pastor Brent said, we kind of do the first two songs uh, right away. And then we take some time at the end to just worship, to lift our voices. And I encourage you to really, it's the middle of summer, it's hot outside, we have air conditioning in here, and so take some time, don't, don't be in a hurry. Take some time, lift your voice, sing to God, and if you need prayer for anything that you're facing, anything that's going on in your life, this team is up here to pray with you about any choices that you have, any trials that you're facing, anything that's going on. It's an incredible opportunity that you have every single week. And you may, most weeks you may go and like, I don't need prayer for anything. But if God's stirring anything in you of like, why don't you pray about this? I had a friend who came to me with a really complicated decision this week of like, what do I do? And it was, it, you can make one, you could turn right, you could turn left. It was this complicated choice. And I encouraged him like, okay, think through it and find someone and pray through it and we prayed with them about it. And so that's what God's called us to do. So we're going to take some time and we're going to worship and then the altars are going to be open where you can go and just, these people are great. They're incredible. They love you deeply and they love to pray about what's going on in your life and what's going on in your story. So if you would actually just open up your hands like this, just a simple act of surrender. And we say, Jesus, we turn our hearts towards you. We turn our lives towards you, Lord. We thank you for what you've done in our lives. We thank you for what you've done in our stories, Lord. I pray that you would bless us and that you would continue to draw us towards you continue to give us wisdom courage and strength to live like Peter did in your name Amen <laughs>